Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I think we better get started. I'm obviously this podium and the mic's on the wrong side of the room, but um, there will be a few more people filtering in uh, throughout the morning. I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Lawyers as Lobbyists. I'm Laurel Evans, a program planning lawyer with the Law Society's Continuing Legal Education Department. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity, uh, first thing this morning, to uh, thank today's uh, faculty, uh, not only for coming to speak to you today, but also for all of the time and the effort that they've put into preparing the materials and the videotape that you'll see uh, later on this morning. <clears throat> As you may know, the Continuing Legal Education Department is a non-profit arm of the Law Society which is reliant upon the efforts of volunteer lawyers from across the province in order to be able to continue presenting programs such as the one that you're about to see today. Okay, so now I'd like to uh, take the opportunity to, to introduce to you the chair of today's program, Ronald Atkey. Ron Atkey is a senior partner in the Toronto office of Osler, Hoskin and Harcourt and is co-chair of the Public Law and Regulatory Affairs Department consisting of 12 lawyers in uh, Ottawa and six lawyers in Toronto. Since 1974, Ron has practiced in the area of uh, corporate and administrative law, specializing in matters of government regulation and international business transactions. Mr. Atke has been active in public life. He was elected Member of Parliament for St. Paul's in 1972 and 1974, and again in 1979-80 when he served uh, as Minister of Employment and Immigration. During 1984 through 1989, he served as the first Chairman of the Security Intelligence Review Committee established to oversee the Canadian Security Intelligence Service, CISIS. He has also advised the federal government on competition law and international trade. Okay, so without uh, further ado, I'd like to ask Ron to come up and uh, commence the proceeding. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction, uh, Laurel, and it's my uh, privilege and honour to be asked uh, by Continuing Legal Education of the Law Society to chair this somewhat interesting and novel program. Um, I have two remarks about uh, uh, the positioning and the attendance today. First, obviously, we would have had double the attendance had there not been a federal election in progress because most of the active lawyer lobbyists are out in the hustings uh, where some uh, who I know are in the room today would rather be. Um, the second is I think uh, we might refocus this event a little bit if, before I start my formal remarks, some of you felt compelled to get up and sprint to the middle of the room uh, instead of being on the far right, that is my far right, or uh, if I want to put it in pejorative sense, uh, the far left. And uh, so I would invite anyone who is uh, way over there to please come and join us right here in the middle and we can have a much uh, friendlier discussion with our, uh, with our panels. Uh, to repeat uh, a general um, position of the, the CLE group within the Law Society, uh, it's important when we come to uh, question and answer uh, sessions today, and we hopefully will have a fair amount of dialogue with the speakers and the panelists, uh, that uh, you, sp you, you put your question as loudly as you can and uh, don't be uh, frustrated if the person taking your question first repeats it. Uh, that is for the benefit of those who are not here in the room today but will want to have the benefit of uh, the videotape replay uh, at some distant location such as their cottage or their ski chalet uh, as they contemplate next winter uh, the joys of uh, lobbying as lawyers. And uh, uh, so, so we will have that uh, slight time delay as uh, questions are, are asked. Now my first task today uh, in addition to introducing the panel um, is to offering to offer uh, use some remarks uh, on lobbying as a professional activity for lawyers. And I start from uh, the most common phrase that is uttered at a cocktail party or any gathered of lawyers uh, when the word lobbying is mentioned and aside from some bad lawyer jokes which are now turned into lobbyist jokes, uh, the general approach is lobbying, we, we don't do that sort of work. Um, it's the sort of thing that they used to say around my firm when they mentioned uh, criminal law. Uh, we don't do that sort of work. Uh, and yet, uh, 
things do change in the real world, and at my firm, which is traditionally a large corporate and commercial full-service firm, we now admit that we do lobbying as a professional activity. Um, you've also heard it at uh, gatherings of lawyers, the general approach uh, taken by many experienced hands, say, well, you know, when you've got a government problem, you don't really need a lawyer. What you really need is a good lobbyist well-connected with the government. And uh, I think that was an approach which typified uh, uh, the professional position of lawyers in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but that in turn may be changing. Certainly any of those who have cast their eyes to the south and watched professional uh, growth among large law firms in the United States, and particularly in Washington, would believe here that uh, there is an area of professional activity that lawyers do perform and perform rather well. Indeed, I, I would suggest that uh, for those who want to ignore lobbying for lawyers, we're ignoring lost professional opportunities. And we may well abdicate important high quality work requiring legal or law related skills. We're abdicating this to non-legally trained persons who are not always capable of serving clients' needs and resolving problems with the government. Now, this comment is not to suggest that there isn't a, an important role for the non-lawyer government relations expert. In fact, um, I have worked, and I know a number in the room have worked with some rather high-quality non-lawyers. Sometimes we work jointly. Some cases we assist the clients in hiring the appropriate firm. Sometimes those clients uh, work with a, a GR firm to, to determine which lawyers or which law firm they'll hire. And particularly on a major acquisition, uh, merger, takeover of, of some public moment involving regulatory oversight by a government agency or board, uh, the involvement of the lawyers and the government relations firm together as part of the overall strategy team is absolutely essential. Um, now, the lawyering function in lobbying, um, all of us have our own sets of categories as to what lawyers do and what lawyers can't do, and I know Graham Scott and David Smith will share with you their views, uh, as well Car Carl Jaffrey, um, in terms of the lawyering function and dealing with government. I've always tended to classify the professional function into three. The first is as a strategist, second as an advocate, and third as a solicitor, a more traditional function. Now let me deal briefly with each of those. First of all, uh, I believe, and it's my experience, that lawyers have analytical skills which are very useful in identifying and isolating problems. With the knowledge of the structure of government and how it works, the lawyer is well equipped to advocate a suitable starting point or level for intervention, as well as to the means of intervention, whether it's a telephone call, letter meeting, uh, personal visit, publicity, uh, media exposure, or court action. The lawyer's perspective is useful in determining who should constitute the team to manage the client's case whether you have a GR firm, a PR firm, whether you have an advertising agency, whether you have media advisors, you do media training, economic researchers, accountants, coalition builders. There's a whole range of prof professional activity that I believe the lawyer can't necessarily provide, but his judgment and experience or her judgment and experience brought to bear on the problem can be of immense assistance uh, to the client in determining who to hire. Also, the Lawyer brings particular coaching skills uh, to a particular case, making sure that the client and their principal representatives are brought up to speed, both in terms of process and the implementation of a, a lobbying program once agreed on. And I like to compare the lawyer's role as a strategist uh, on a uh, lobbying case uh, to the lawyer on a major merger acquisition or takeover. Uh, the lawyer does not have the exclusive role, but you sure wouldn't want to structure a team without one. Now the second uh, function of the lawyer uh, as a lobbyist is as an advocate. Now this is the obvious one. This is the one the public sees, 
the one that you perhaps most identify with. Uh, advocating uh, the proposing, making, or amending of a law or regulation. And this can involve submissions to public servants, uh, to a minister or ministerial staff, to legislative committee, individual MPs or MPPs, um, or the seeking of relief um, respecting the enforcement, interpretation, or application of a statute or regulation by a government agency, board, or commission, or tribunal. Administrative law, if you will or the public advocacy of a particular policy or legislative program, merely putting out a brief for public discussion, giving a speech in a public forum, either on your own behalf as a member of the profession or as an acknowledged representative of a client interest. The third function of the lawyer is one that is not as seen as much, but perhaps is performed uh, most often uh, on a day-to-day -day basis is not, may, be, may not be recognized always as lobbying, and this is the solicitor function. And this is the, the lawyer who assists in seeking the award of grants or other benefits under government programs, obtaining uh, or implementing contracts awarded by government. Now, this role is multifaceted. In addition to identifying government grants and contract opportunities for clients, the client is, the lawyer is uniquely qualified to advise on conditions of eligibility, compliance and reporting rules, definitions and presentation of qualifications, negotiation of terms, advice on tax considerations, coordination of closing arrangements, preparation of documentation, preservation of good standing status during the term of the contract or the award of grant, and finally the avoidance of early termination, including asserting the legal rights to due process and procedural fairness in the event of termination. Now these, in many respects, are the same skills a corporate and commercial lawyer brings to negotiating and implementing a contract for a client. But dealing with a government and a government agency uh, does have special considerations, which I know some of the speakers today will go into. Okay, we've defined the various things the lawyer does. What regulates us? Well, as lawyers, the first place we go uh, is not to any lobbyist registration act. We go to the Law Society of Upper Canada here in the province of Ontario and we look at the professional conduct handbook. I have in my paper today given you um, some of the rules which I believe should be kept uh, immediately at hand for those of you who are contemplating engaging in, in lobbying activity. Uh, some of them may or may not be relevant, but I think they're there and it's helpful to remind ourselves of our duties as lawyers uh, in the lobbying process. The first one which I have come up against more often than not is the lawyer's duty to hold in strict confidence all the information concerning the business and affairs of the client acquired in the course of the professional relationship and not to divulge that information unless expressly or impliedly authorized by the client or required to do so by law. Too often uh, we take uh, as a given a mandate from our client to disclose if we think it's in the client's interest and would to disclose to a public servant without going back to the client and asking them. And I remind you of your professional duty to have that permission expressly if necessary when negotiating or advocating a position on behalf of a client to a, to a government. And of course, uh, the whole issue of whether this rule comes into conflict with duties under Lobbyist Registration Act at the federal level, under the current Act or Future Act, is a subject which uh, has yet to be considered. Uh, but there is inherently a potential conflict between our duty of confidentiality uh, as stated and required by the Law Society and the duty of disclosure imposed by law by federal statute for those lobbying at the federal level. The second rule I'd refer to is Rule 10, and that is when acting as an advocate, the lawyer, while treating the tribunal with courtesy and respect, must represent the client resolutely and honorably within the limits of the law. And uh, the non-lawyer will say, well, that's an interesting rule. What the hell does that mean? Um, we do, of course, have the advantage in the handbook of a number of examples. And I'll give you just a couple uh, without elaborating. 
It says the lawyer must not, for example, knowingly assist or permit the client to do anything which the lawyer considers to be dishonest or dishonorable. Now, dishonest is a reasonably precise test. That's a violation of the law, I suppose. But dishonorable, that's a, potentially a subjective test. But nevertheless, it's one that the lawyer must apply. But the second must not example is the lawyer must not endeavor or allow anyone, anyone else to endeavor, directly or indirectly, to influence the decision or action of a tribunal or any of its officials in any case or matter by any means other than open persuasion as an advocate. And if one takes the definition of tribunal broadly and say all you can do as a lawyer is open persuasion as an advocate, uh, there is a great deal of what I'd call subrosive activity that may go on or may be undertaken by lobbyists that would not fall within that permission. Uh, there's a third rule, Rule 11, which says, and again, it's, 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 it's sort of ambiguous in its face. It says the lawyer should encourage public respect for and try to improve the administration of justice. Well, sure, no one's going to quarrel with that. That's a motherhood statement. But then you, you, uh, you go to the commentary under that rule, and here you get into the meat. It says the lawyer who seeks legislative or administrative changes should disclose whose interest is being advanced, whether the lawyer's interest, that of a client, or the public interest. The lawyer may advocate such changes on behalf of a client, although not personally agreeing with him. But the lawyer who purports to act in the public interest should espouse only those changes which the lawyer conscientiously believes to be in the public interest. Uh, an interesting reminder of our duty as lawyers. Um, uh, a canon of of interpretation of Rule 11, which is almost impossible to enforce as a practical matter, but I think is helpful is a helpful reminder to us as our duty um, as professionals. And finally, I want to mention uh, Rule uh, 21, um, and this is the recently promulgated rule of lawyers dealing with the media, because. As a lobbyist, as a lawyer as a lobbyist, uh, often we are required to deal with the media in one capacity or another. And I think uh, in the panel on insurance at 11 o'clock this morning, we'll see some excerpts from media where certain lawyers were actually uh, playing a particular role. It says, lawyers in their public appearances and public statements should conduct themselves in the same manner as with their clients, their fellow practitioners, the courts, and tribunals. Dealings with the media are simply an extension of the lawyer's conduct in a professional capacity. The mere fact that a lawyer's appearance is outside of a courtroom, a tribunal, or the lawyer's office does not excuse conduct that would otherwise be considered improper. Well, so far, so good. And then we have an interesting comment under that rule, which may well represent law society approbation for lobbying activity. It says, the lawyer is often involved as an advocate for special interest groups whose objective is to bring about changes in legislation, government policy, or even to heighten public awareness about certain issues. This is also an important role that the lawyer can be called upon to play. Again, if you needed any legislative authorization for lobbying as a legitimate activity for lawyers, there it is in the Code of Professional Conduct. Well, so much for... Uh, the Law Society. Uh, I'm not sure when the code was drafted uh, that lobbying was contemplated as being within the realm of activity. Nevertheless, some of the rules are applicable and no doubt as the rules evolve from time to time, uh, there will be other situations which come to the attention of the Law Society and further rules will be developed. But let's talk about legislation. Um, what is currently going on in Ottawa and what may well go on uh, at Queen's Park, respecting lobbyists. Um, I think it's fair to say, and this is perhaps driven by the success of the Clinton administration in seeking people to attack, and lobbyists were attacked as an industry successfully by the Clinton administration. It aided in the election process, and uh, the rules that have followed from the Clinton administration have, have uh, have, have been brought forward accordingly, uh, making the legal compliance uh, for uh, lobbyists in the United States much more difficult, much more onerous. Um, Ottawa, of course, has had its own 
uh, Lobbyist Registration Act in force since uh, 1989. We, we have the registrar here with us today. And uh, this was basically an exposure statute uh, providing for the registration of paid lobbyists who engage in certain lobbying activities uh, pr involving direct attempts to influence certain government decisions. Um, and it's essentially uh, a basic disclosure statute of who is doing what to whom. Um, of the tier one lobbyists, that is people who are not employees or working for an association, uh, there are some 800 uh, tier one lobbyist registration and of those 800, 300 are lawyers. So some of our profession have come out of the closet vis-a-vis -vis, uh, that disclosure statute. Not all, mind you, but some. Um, and registration activity during the first years has probably been somewhat uneven uh, among members of our profession. Uh, some have taken their responsibilities more seriously than others. Uh, there are two basic reasons that I hear from lawyers who don't register but perhaps should. The first is uh, there's the lawyer's exemption clause in the statute itself. And uh, it's not referred to as such, but it's known colloquially as that. It says, any oral or written submission made to a public office holder by an individual on behalf of a person or organization with respect to the enforcement, interpretation, or application of any act or regulation uh, is in fact an exempt activity, not uh, requiring registration. And I suppose that's reasonable. That's what lawyers do when they approach government in many occasions. It's the enforcement, interpretation, or application of the act. You're not trying to change anything. You're performing the traditional lawyering function. But of course, if you take it beyond that and you're trying to change a regulation, or you're trying to change a program, or you're trying to get a contract for your client, then you're lobbying. And therein lies the distinction. Another reason that lawyers advance to me for not registering is Rule 4, which we referred to, and that is the duty of confidentiality. And they also refer to the evidentiary rule of lawyer and client privilege, which I may well be a red herring, but nevertheless it's raised. Uh, now, Rule 4, of course, does require confidentiality. And if the federal law says you must disclose, and the provincial law says you must not disclose, except with the consent of your client or required to do so by law. Well, by law may well refer to a federal statute, suggesting paramountcy for the federal statute. The simple matter is, of course, you go and get the permission of your client. You say you want me to do an effective job as your lobbyist in Ottawa. I have to disclose this information. I have to register. You have to know that this law firm and this lawyer within that law firm are retained. And if you don't agree to that, I can't represent you in Ottawa. That really is the professional position that I would take and I think most lawyers would take when they examine the conflict between the two. Now that, of course, is, as I suppose, an abdication of a, an opportunity that we would otherwise have as lawyer because then the, the work will go either to a lawyer who doesn't comply with the law or it goes to a, a non-lawyer, God forbid. Um, it is, a, it is an interesting um, uh, process to go through. Uh, my experience is in particularly dealing with foreign clients. The Americans, the American multinationals, are used to this sort of thing, this disclosure statute. Consent is usually given. Uh, European and Asian clients are not used to disclosure, are not used to transparency, and there's an educational job to be done. And that's where you will anticipate your, your greatest uh, resistance. Now, the Lobbyist Registration Act went through three quiet years. Um, number of lawyers have registered. I indicated it's over 300. Um, there was a required review by a parliamentary committee chaired by Felix Holtzman. They reported last June, recommended rather sweeping amendments to that act, more disclosure, uh, both in terms of the subject matter of the lobbying and who is going to be lobbied. And if, not, if that was not enough, the Prime Minister, speaking in Vancouver on August 9th, has said, I think these recommendations are all good. I'm going to implement them if elected October 25th. Moreover, I'm going to put in some new uh, wrinkles, such as requiring any lobbyist to disclose whatever political party that they have worked or for or whatever public office they have held. So the ante has been upped. And then, I believe, maybe two weeks ago, Mr. Kretjen, uh, up the ante even further by 
saying, yes, we support the Holtman Committee and the remarks of the Prime Minister, but we think we'll go one step further. There'll be a new ethics counselor. Uh, and that ethics counselor will have some undefined role in dealing not only with elected people, but, God forbid, with lobbyists. So the point I want to make is that no matter what happens on October 25th, um, short of Preston Manning becoming Prime Minister, that uh, there is going to be activity in this field, and there's going to be activity soon, and the lobby industry, including lawyers, are going to be targeted. And what does that have today with our session on lobbying Queen's Park? That I have to believe, as a practical political matter, that the Ray government will be unable to resist the lure of introducing and enacting mirror legislation or similar legislation as they complete their run-up to the next provincial election in 1994-95. Uh, this is legislation which is attractive because it targets a group. I mean, can you imagine you get lawyers and lobbyists all in one group and you can target them? And more important, it doesn't cost anything, which is why it may be well attractive uh, to the government of Queen's Park and is indeed attractive to government or would-be governments in Ottawa. So if this is going to be the case, what do we do as professionals? And the answer is prepare. And start to plan on the basis that it's coming. Um, my suggestion clearly is if you are engaging or plan to engage in this kind of professional activity, you should become familiar with the legislative and regulatory requirements and immediately put in place an internal compliance mechanism to ensure strict adherence to the legislative and regulatory requirements by all members of the firm who may be participating in professional activities constituting lobbying. And you'd be amazed at the number of lawyers who are lobbying and don't know it. Uh, the area within our firm that was the greatest, most fertile ground for registration was not the government relations people like Michael Goff and myself, it was the tax department. And those guys were up in Ottawa every day of the week making proposals to amend regulations. And that's lobbying. Uh, now they comply. Uh, it wasn't without some difficulty, but finally they read the law and they believed as lawyers they should comply with federal law. And I think any law firm should be well advised to be aware of this requirement. And if it comes at Queen's Park to take it seriously, just as if you're in the securities business, you take the requirements of the Ontario Securities Commission very seriously. If you're in the law business, you take the requirements of the Law Society very seriously. And if you're in the lobbying business, you take the legal requirements of the lobbyist registration branch in Ottawa and at Queen's Park very seriously. Now, I'm going to conclude my remarks not by going through uh, pages 9 through 11 of my paper, which are at Key's 10 helpful hints for lobbyists who are lawyers. Um, you can read those um, at your leisure, and I know some of them will be repeated today by uh, Graham Scott and Carl Jaffrey and Judith Wolfson. Um, I do want to refer just, I guess, for, to a couple, because I think they go to the heart of uh, being successful or not being successful uh, as a lawyer lobbyist. Uh, the first one is, of course, don't ask government for a response or a decision that you know they can't give. That seems almost too simplistic to mention, but your clients will ask you to do this, to ask the impossible, and you have to work with your client to deal with the possible. Lay out the alternative courses of action that you think the government can take within existing policy parameters, even though some of those may not be to the liking of your client, but they may not be as bad as some of the other alternatives. And so above all, remember that government, like politics, is the art of the possible, not the absolute. And the other helpful hint, and that some of us have learned, I guess, uh, through trial and error and bad experiences, is avoid threats, except as a, as a very last resort. Going to a minister or to an elected official or to the premier's office or to the prime minister's office in many cases, that is a threat which will fracture a relationship. It's regarded as a hostile act, and you only do, do it if, if all else has failed. And uh, indeed, uh, it's a pretty good sign that you're going to lose if you have to go at that level to achieve what you want. 
and similarly threatening going to court. Sure, there is a place for uh, adjudication by judges of uh, genuine disputes between the private sector and the government. But just because you're a lawyer and you can turn your litigators loose in the government, be very careful in the use of that particular weapon. I found that rather than immediately threatening the, the government official with the lawyer's demand letter, maybe a gentle suggestion that they want to have a representative of the Attorney General at the next meeting. Uh, and you say that if the, if the law is in your favor, <laughs> in many cases. Uh, if you've got some legal research and it looks good for you, share it with the government. Say, you know, my client's paid for this, but I thought you'd be interested in the case law that we've developed on, on this particular subject. Uh, even the draft statement of claim, which is becoming a very effective tool, it's well used within government circles. Don't issue the statement of claim and then the press release because then you've immediately boxed yourself in. Do quietly the draft statement of claim, send it to the director that you're dealing with and say, you know, more out of sorrow than anger, we've had to prepare this. We want you to consider with it, discuss it with the Justice Department, and then let's talk. And that, as a lawyer, is, is a technique that will um, often be effective. In conclusion, I think we as lawyers and as a profession um, have to be careful as we approach lobbying activities in the 90s. I think how we approach the activity of lobbying will determine in some measure at least how we're perceived by the public. To the extent that we as lawyers avoid or ignore registration or disclosure requirements or try to treat the process as an old boys network or one of political contacts um, will simply give rise to public cynicism and more bad lawyers jokes. And I think there will be a harsher regulatory regime than the one at present. On the other hand, if we accept registration or disclosure requirements, we take our law society obligations seriously. We regard lobbying by lawyers as a legitimate activity. Um, then we stand a greater chance of effectively serving our clients as well as reinforcing in the, reinforcing in the public mind the value of lobbying as a professional activity. Uh, I can make a case, and as I know some of our other speakers will today, that lobbying does represent an effective tool of policy development within government. I think government has improved at the federal and provincial levels with effective lobbyists who communicate information, help departmental decision makers, ensure that opposing viewpoints are heard. Uh, and I think this is all part of modern public policy making. And the right to lobby government is a fundamental right within a democracy. But we're in an environment where the perception of lobbyists continues to be negative, since many are seen as having undue influence as a result of their power to mold and influence government decisions. And I want to congratulate the Law Society and Laurel Evans on having the foresight to initiate this program today and to bring this area of practice out of the closet and into the glare of public scrutiny and professional accountability. Thank you. Now, our next two speakers, um, um, our next speaker, I should say, uh, is uh, no stranger to the field of lobbying, no stranger to the field of politics. He's a partner um, with the Fraser Beatty firm here in Toronto. Um, David Smith um, was called to the bar in 1972, and um, as campaign manager for my liberal opponent, promptly lost his first election. Uh, he then went on for his, uh, to a distinguished uh, uh, career at City Hall, where he was uh, not the lobbyist, but the lobbied as a city councillor uh, in the municipality metropolitan Toronto. Um, he had uh, had some time as an executive assistant to the Honorable John Turner and to the Honorable Walter Gordon. Um, he finally got elected in 1980 as the Member of Parliament for Don Valley East. Uh, and that's the year I lost, David. Uh, and then he was appointed to the cabinet, finally, uh, in the last year of the Trudeau regime of 1983-1984 as Minister of Small Business and Tourism. He has uh, finally come into his own as the campaign manager for the uh, 
Liberal Party in the current election uh, campaign in the province of Ontario, and uh, we're very pleased that he should take time uh, away from his duties as campaign manager and from appearances before the Racing Commission to share his views today on what lawyers can do that others can't. David Smith. Are those mics on there? Maybe I'll sit there. Yeah. Well, maybe there is a logical connection between appearances before the Racing Commission and elections. I don't know. I'll leave that up to you. I apologize uh, for not having a text, but uh, as Ron has mentioned, I have uh, noble and pressing pursuits that are occupying a lot of my time until the 25th of October. and. Uh, I felt if I didn't have the time to do it properly, I probably shouldn't uh, really try. So I apologize for that. <clears throat> uh, lobbying in, in Canada, I think uh, some of us who've had experiences dealing in Washington uh, might feel that until just recently, we were in the dark ages compared to the Americans. And I think most Canadians in many ways kind of preferred it that way. Uh, just 10 years ago, when I was in Parliament and in the government, you know, we used to think of about three firms that were in this business in Ottawa, and there was the odd Lone Ranger out there, but by and large it was three firms, and none of them were that big, and none of them were very old. In fact, uh, as Ron mentioned, uh, I've done several stints in Ottawa, but an earlier one, back in the 60s, in the Pearson government, I was there. Uh, as the executive assistant of Walter Gordon when we had that huge debate about American banks in Canada and the Mercantile Bank of Canada. I don't know if many of you recall that one, but I spent several months of my life with that as my main preoccupation. And when I look back on it now, there were lawyers all over the place and, uh, you know, the uh, Bankers Association was all over the place. But here we ha had as important uh, a policy issue being debated as uh, many people will think as any. And I can't recall one single lobbyist, pure lobbyist, being involved. And so while I may be a bit long in the tooth, I'm not that long in the tooth. And it's kind of interesting that just during the, uh, my working career, you know, we've gone in Canada from virtually nothing to a full-flown industry. And without meaning to sound partisan, I really don't mean to sound partisan. You know, in the last several years, you know, perhaps the two greatest growth industries in this country have been receiverships and lobbyists uh, because uh, <laughs> when you look at the number that there are in, uh, in Ottawa, it, it has had a dramatic increase. But I think generally Canadians preferred kind of not to think about it. They preferred a more civilized approach as compared to the sort of blatant and structured machines that exist in uh, the United States whose uh, sole purpose is to influence, influence various government decisions. Uh, you know, that movie, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, was made over 50 years ago, but I think that the sort of murky world of political connections was shaped by uh, things like that, and it was an area that a lot of people, and particularly Canadians, didn't want to have anything to do with. Uh, I think there are some fundamental differences between us and the Americans that will keep the approach here different and I could comment on a number of them, but which I don't have time to. But perhaps one is the whole business of the separation of powers as opposed to a parliamentary system. Uh, we, we have, generally speaking, in this country, uh, disciplined political parties. Now, when you listen to some recent speeches by Steve Langdon, you may not think that's the case. But uh, the norm is you've got one party position on a policy issue. Uh, whereas in the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Senate, where you've uh, got a relatively independent uh, congressional or legislative body, I mean, you've got to go together. You've got to go and put together a voting coalition on every single issue. You know, you don't have to just persuade the minister or persuade the opposition critic. You've got to persuade a, a whole bunch of people, and those coalitions can shift for a variety of reasons and uh, vote trading and things like that. Now, I think most of us feel that that isn't a particularly 
healthy form of government. But you know it exists at the municipal level here, and I've done a fair bit of uh, work on um, municipal issues. And uh, at, at any city council or at metro council, you know, if you're promoting a particular position that you think has merit, uh, the fact that the uh, mayor may be in favor of it or the metro chairman may be in favor of it, that's one vote out of 17 or one vote out of 33 or whatever it is. So that, you know, there are certainly some analogies to the American type of approach that you have at the municipal level here, but not at the senior level of government. Um, now, we, we, you know, in the states, of course, you've got a whole bunch of different categories. You have all these political action groups, too. And I guess the most notorious one is the NRA. But, I mean, there are hundreds of them, even thousands of them. And uh, in, uh, in Ottawa, and uh, at Queen's Park, we have them too. One I might just make reference to that perhaps had a little more publicity in recent years is the Pharmaceuticals uh, Association. And it's kind of interesting that it's uh, uh, headed up by Judy Arla, who was a uh, minister in the last Trudeau government and obviously a liberal. But when she was hired, she was hired after the Mulroney government had come in and obviously uh, the people in the pharmaceuticals industry didn't think it would handicap them to have a former prominent liberal as head of their association. In fact, perhaps the, somebody obviously thought there might even be an advantage to it. And I think the advantage uh, should be clear to everyone that you know they didn't uh, want whatever their various causes might be to appear to be determined on the basis of cronyism. And uh, I think in a way that's uh, kind of a healthy thing. And uh, obviously, in terms of being effective, uh, the Pharmaceuticals Association were effective in getting legislation that they were in support of through. Maybe maybe, might have been a little different if they'd have written the bill. Some people may argue they did. You can get a range of opinions on that. But uh, it's, it's also kind of interesting that uh, to the extent that uh, she and that association may have been pressing their viewpoints on the opposition parties, and the official opposition in particular, they didn't get anywhere. And maybe that's healthy too. And maybe that says something uh, for the legitimacy of uh, not automatically assuming that uh, political cronyism is going to determine the way in which things go. Um, in, in the in the states, you know, you get you, you get uh, specialization to an extent that can sometimes be mind-boggling. I remember being at a uh, dinner one time in Washington, and I was talking to the guy beside me, and I said, "What do you do?" Oh, he says, I uh, raise money for Republican Senate campaigns. I said, do you do anything else? Yes, I do certain lobbying contracts. I says, do you do any other campaigns? No, just Republican Senate campaigns. And he had broken in with uh, Senator John Tower from Texas, as some of you may recall. And, uh, and you know, there it was very much tied in. His political activities and his lobbying activities were very integrally uh, associated. And uh, I think it's stuff like that, which I, I think sometimes gives people uh, an impression of an odd aroma about that whole area in the United States. Actually, the most vivid recollection I have about that conversation was, he said, you're from Canada. I, I said, yeah. He said, uh, well, you know, on our, um, most, we do most of our fundraising out of Canada. I said, how's that? Well, we do it out of Windsor. He said, you know, we discovered some time ago that you could dial for information in Canada free, you know, the 555-1212. And he says, in the States, they charge 60 cents for each one. So he says, we've got a bank of people up in an office in Windsor, Ontario, phoning all over North America, get phone numbers for people, and we do it out of there because it's cheaper. Uh, <laughs> never forget that one. Um, I, I know some other people in Washington who are you know, one will be a Republican, one will be a Democrat, and it's very sort of partisan-oriented uh, rather than specialty-oriented. In other words, uh, their activities really have to do with who they know rather than uh, expertise. Uh, I, th I think that that, again, is an atmosphere that perhaps we as lawyers don't particularly want to be associated with. And I remember a few years ago, I was acting for a Canadian company that had run afoul of what was called IMF funding. Now, IMF funding is uh, international military sales funding in the United States. And what it was is that if you're a foreign country who the United States 
has on the friendly list, you can borrow money from them to purchase military hardware at 2% interest rates. But you can only purchase it from approved suppliers. And in order for you to be an approved supplier, you don't have to be an American company, but you have to adhere to certain things. Well, this particular Canadian company, which made military trucks, had run afoul. It's a bizarre story. I won't get into it. But the long and short of it was that I made many trips to Washington on this, eventually solved it. Not in time, though. The company didn't survive, but we did solve it. But I dealt with, I dealt with one particular Washington law firm where they had 22 lawyers who did nothing other than work on contracts with the U.S. Defense Department. And the, area, the degree of expertise that they had was quite phenomenal. And I used to talk to some of these guys about, uh, you know, whether they had much input into uh, the development of policy. Well, I said certainly not in terms of military or foreign policy, but in terms of procurement policies, yes, they had a lot of influence. And, uh, you know, it was in interest of all of them to try and ensure that the system provided a level playing field. And I think that uh, to the extent per that perhaps some of us might uh, see activities in Washington that uh, we do not view with distaste, uh, it's that type of thing, you know, whereby you are uh, refining certain skills that really just fall into the legal category and that uh, you can advance the cause of your clients for bona fide corporate objectives. Uh, and that was uh, one area where I, uh, I learned a lot. As a totally irrelevant aside, I remember I, I also had something to do a couple of times with uh, people who'd been involved in airplane crashes, and I had to do, deal with a Washington law firm where they had eight lawyers who did nothing other than deal with airplane crashes. Hopefully that's not a growth industry. Uh, but I remember saying to, to the senior partner one time, I says, now be honest with me, when you read about a plane crash, how do you react? He says, I feel terrible for two minutes, and then I feel, well, somebody's got to do it, you know, and they're on the phone. So uh, that's irrelevant to what we're talking about. To get back to Canada and the uh, role for lawyers and the legitimate role for lawyers, I think that there are things that lawyers can do that, that pure lobbyist professionals uh, are handicapped in doing and really can't do. I think, for example, that some government officials, I have sensed sometimes, they're more comfortable in dealing with lawyers. Uh, particularly if, you know, you, you bring legal skills to the table, uh, as opposed to perhaps just opening doors. And in terms of what some of those skills are, uh, we chatted the other day on uh, the phone. We had a telephone conference, but a couple that clearly emerged, you know, is uh, identifying proper legal responses and a proper legal framework to um, address a problem that advances the cause of your corporate client, presumably in a bona fide way. Uh, but I think, uh, and this is perhaps repeating some of the points that Ron has made, that this is a role that is particularly unique to lawyers in terms of being present at the outset in terms of strategy. Whereas somebody that falls into the pure uh, lobbyist category, really a lot of what they're doing is, is in the public relations category. And so that, you know, they may be involved in a selling job, but not determining what it is that should be sold. And uh, I think that there are opportunities for lawyers to say, well, you know, you can't do that, and you can't do that for jurisdictional reasons, you can't do that for enforcement reasons, you can't do that because there's, there's some case law which says you can't do it, and here are all the problems. Uh, and that's uh, an area where I think that, that lawyers have an advantage, and a, a real advantage, over somebody that falls in the pure lobbyist category. And that doesn't mean that uh, there aren't people in the pure lobbyist category that have uh, very impressive skills and that you work together as part of a team. But it is to say that I think that there are situations where lawyers bring something unique to the table. Drafting skills. This is also a very important uh, tool. Sometimes it may be in terms of uh, regulations, uh, you know, in the odd bizarre situation, and I've encountered this with a couple of smaller provinces where, you know, they didn't have uh, in-house 
the same sort of talent that you might get in larger governments, that uh, they'd be receptive to uh, you doing a draft of something. Always put it on blank paper, certainly not firm letterhead or that. And, you know, it's, it's my view that the chances that you might have some input there are better if you're not too pushy about it. You know, if you get pushy, they'll resist that. And I also think that uh, you have more chance to do that if you say, well, let me draft, let me provide you with three or four ways in which all are reasonable and various merits, pros and cons, but ways in which, you know, you could achieve this policy objective in a legislative framework. And I think that this is something that is unique. Uh, to a lawyer that uh, really uh, a pure lobbyist is not going to be able to do. Now, at, at the municipal level, of course, this is something that is uh, routine, that if you're advancing a certain position and you've got people who are sympathetic to that view, don't rely on them to word the proper motion. I mean, draft one. And, and my approach is, I'll say, now look, if this is what you want to do, if you want to get from A to B, I think this motion does it, but review it with the, with the city solicitor. In other words, satisfy yourself. You don't want to do a con job on somebody because you'll only ever do that once uh, for obvious reasons. And so uh, I, I have found that uh, at the municipal level that uh, sometimes people are fairly receptive to it. Again, I think that uh, you, you probably have more impact and more input if you maybe give them a range of approaches, all of which you can live with. And you know, you may say, here's my first choice, here's my second choice, and if we have to, we can live with this, but these are ways in which you do it. Because if you don't do that, believe me, I have sat, and I see Patrick here, who I know has certainly heard speeches of people will, will be in support of the cause you're advancing, and then they'll move some cockamamie motion, which doesn't implement what they even perhaps want to do. And so it's just too risky to leave to chance. Um, I'm jumping around a bit, but I want to touch on a few points. I, I think that Ron has uh, given wise advice uh, when uh, he suggests that you should play down or minimize so-called political contacts. And uh, you, you may think that's odd coming from me, but I really believe that. And uh, I think that there are good points in Ron's paper here that if, if you sort of flaunt the uh, fact that you know everybody, it, it'll work against you. It, it, you know, people don't like that. I think you have to people uh, deal with people with respect. And you know, it's always been my sense that uh, if you deal properly with people in the bureaucracy, and I, I, I use that word respectively, or or the civil service, if you, if you deal with them uh, properly, they generally know uh, that, that you can get in to see the minister if you need to. And frequently it will have a salutary impact on the way they at least hear you out. And that's all you can really ask for, is you know, a fair hearing. But I think that the uh, salutary impact is going to be greatest if you're tasteful about it and don't even talk about it because they'll usually know. Um, now on the advocate role, I think this is a good advice that uh, Ron has given. I remember years ago chatting with Bill Lee who was really one of the pioneers in this area. He founded a firm called Executive Consultants which I think was one of the first, maybe even the first. It was the first. Yeah, and uh, I think he founded it in the late 60s. He'd been the executive assistant to Paul Hellyer. Uh, Bill Lee never looked as old as he was. I read in Eric Nielsen's book that Bill had been his commanding officer in the Second World War, and I thought, boy, he must have found the elixir of life, and I wondered what it was. But Bill used to say to me that he, he would never go to the meetings with the government officials, except only in the most unusual circumstances. He would never play the advocate role because he felt you could only do it so many times and you just wore out the welcome. So what was the point? So that his view was uh, you give them the strategy, you tell them who's who, who's where in the pecking order, backgrounders on the key decision makers, what their biases may be, what their prejudices may be, and we all have them, and the challenge is to find out what they are, 
and you know, try and perhaps uh, be cognizant of what people's biases may be or what their angles are. But Bill uh, would never do that, whereas I think a lawyer can do it. I also agree that on balance, the, the, the best lead spokesperson is the client themselves, if they're able to do it. Sometimes they are, but not always. Uh, and sometimes uh, you can help them a lot in this regard. But I think there is a role for the lawyer to be there as the advocate to chip in, particularly with legal perspectives from time to time, which uh, uh, I think uh, can be very useful. Um, I think I've already touched on the level of intervention. Don't start at the top. Uh, there's an acquaintance of mine who's tried to develop a practice in this area for some years and never really got it off the ground because whenever he'd hear about a problem, the first thing he'd do would be phone the mayor or phone the minister. Well, that's the last thing you should do. Literally, it's the last thing you should do. You know, you work your way up and, uh, and you are uh, respectful uh, to people in government. And my general view is if all else has failed and somebody comes in and they say, I want to retain you, and uh, what is it for? Oh, well, you know so-and-so, and, you know, he's the minister, regardless of what stripe they happen or what shirt they wear. Uh, I don't really need retainers like that. In other words, I, I want to be involved early on or not at all. It's just not worth it. Uh, now, uh, and, and the other thing, you know, you, that I think people should appreciate, and this gets a bit delicate, is that... Uh, you know, I, I honestly think there's probably more political dynamics or politics that goes on within government itself than the political parties. I remember a priest once told me, Smith, there's more politics in the Roman Catholic Church than there are in the Liberal Party. That's probably true of all, of all religion. It's just a, a, a fact of human nature. Uh, but I think there are a couple of main reasons uh, why people in the civil service will more often than not have more influence on determining what the government policy is than the minister is number one they've got the time and more often than not they've got more expertise than any minister will ever have i mean if you take the the a week out of the life of a an average minister you know so many days are spent sitting in the house and you know and the amount of uh, rigorous mental activity that goes on in there has its limitations, but you know it takes hours out of your weekly schedule. Then you're going back to your constituents to uh, sit in the office and to listen to a range of complaints. That can take hours every week. So much time traveling, uh, you know, and and then you've got um, perha perhaps uh, going to committees and defending your position, giving speeches. The amount of hours in any given week that a minister of whatever has to think about policy formulation, you're lucky if it's two or three hours. That's the truth of the matter. Whereas, you know, if you've got some person in the civil service that this is clearly their area, it's their chair, so to speak, that's the person that is going to have by far and away the most influence in determining what the policy will be. And yes, they'll have to put it in front of the minister and get the good housekeeping seal of approval, but the number of instances in which at the ministerial level it's changed are not too many. So that's another reason why I, I feel very strongly that uh, go right up the ladder. And you know, if you're not getting anywhere with the first in, person in the first rung, I think it's always best to say, now listen, you know, my clients, uh, this is life and death for my client. I've, I've got to go go to go up the ladder, but I want you to know about it. There'll be no surprises, no ambushes. And I think if you ever try the ambush route, you know, all you do is burn bridges and eliminate future dialogue, and that's not in your interest, and it's certainly not in the interest of your uh, client. Um, now, there are uh, a number of very good points that are in here on pages 9 and... Uh, Avoiding partisan politics, I, I agree with that uh, very much so. You know, I think that, and, and Bill is here, that when, you're, when you sit in the House, you know, you develop respect for your colleagues regardless of what stripe they are. And if you uh, treat them with respect, they will generally treat you with respect. There's the odd one who doesn't do that, who gets personal. 
and gets nasty and they pay for it because people don't want to see them. But I think you're uh, always best to avoid partisan approaches when you're doing it on behalf of a client. Well, I think you're best to avoid it all the time uh, unless you're running for office. Um, yes, uh, point six here, I think. Don't, don't ask for a response that the government official cannot give. You know, when you're in government, you'll be the recipient of endless pleas for largesse uh, for some worthy cause for which no program even exists. And, you know, I can think of numerous occasions where you'd see some program and you'd say, why in the world was that program ever set up? Well, there's usually a story. And it's usually that because somebody wanted to do something to solve this, they had to create a program which sometimes was a bit cockamamie and didn't survive. Uh, but uh, that is, that is, if, for example, you're ever needing some uh, special particular action, you know, you have to uh, do it, generally speaking, in the context of a program of a general government policy. Well, you know, and I think that uh, there's going to be less of that because the dollars are running out. So I think regardless of who gets elected in this next election, there's going to be uh, less and less of that. Uh, Ron mentioned that I might just touch on for a second, and I'll be brief because uh, we've got to stay in schedule, and I have to go to the racing commission, as Ron says. But I think on the subject of fees, there's, it's hard to have a general rule. I just think you just take a common sense approach. You know, uh, sometimes you can do it on straight, normal hourly rates. Uh, sometimes if you're doing something above and beyond, you may think a premium is appropriate and you should discuss that in, with your client in advance. Uh, Sometimes it can be flat rates. It's just, it's, it's, it's hard to generalize about this. You just have to have a feel for it and have common sense. Now, when you're dealing with American clients, uh, that's quite different. I, I've got a large U.S. corporation uh, out of New York that I do some work with. And, uh, you know, they send up these forms that they have for everybody who does work of a certain nature. Now, you, and, and they say, now you have to divide all your time that's in a, of a pure legal nature has to be in one bill, and all your time that's uh, of in the lobbying category is uh, in another bill. And they want them literally in separate bills and because they have a very different approach to A as opposed to B. And uh, I can spend a lot of time on that. It drives you crazy sometimes. But, you know, they just have a different mentality. And I mean, a contingency approach or uh, an incentive approach. They don't like the word contingency. And of course, we can't use it. But, uh, <clears throat> well, you get such and such a, a percentage if you're successful. And that's certainly well over 100%. You know, it might be 200% or 300%. And if you're not successful, it's. 30% or 50% or you might haggle or that sort of thing. But the only advice I would give you on that is whatever the arrangement is, be clear about it because otherwise it can, uh, it can be a problem. Now, uh, in conclusion, I think that this is an area of activity that there will be more regulation of. It is inevitable. There's the mood out there with the public to do it. Uh, we have the influence of the American experience here, which I think propels us in that direction. And I think, quite frankly, uh, without, uh, I don't mean to be partisan at all, but I think this whole helicopter issue will probably result in things being tightened up. Because, you know, if you look at that last Tory leadership and you look at who all the key players were and who all the key lobbyists were, all the bases were covered. You know, and any shrewd student of this area of human activity can figure that out. And politicians in all political parties have figured that out. The media have figured that out. The public are starting to have a bit of a handle on it. And it isn't to say that this type of activity has to cease and desist, but it has to be open and regulated. And that's as it should be. And I think on balance that probably means that there's a greater role for lawyers in this activity, particularly if they deploy these skills that are unique to them. And uh, I guess that's why we're here. So I hope that covers my area. Uh, Thank you very much, David.
Before Brother Smith departs for the uh, Racing Commission, are there any questions uh, that you want to fire on? This may be your last chance. Repeat the question, David. You mean talking to a political assistant? David, repeat the question. Yeah, the question was uh, the difference between dealing with the government per se and and political assistance to the minister. I don't see I don't see any harm in in doing both, as long as you're not trying to end run. You know, in other words, you know, as long as you're not trying to end run the bureaucracy, because if you try and end run them, in the long run, you'll pay for it. And so if you've got people, uh, particularly on the government side of things, uh, who uh, are happy to hear from you, and you know, you're advancing a bona fide uh, perspective on some legitimate corporate objective, uh, I think it's fine to keep them in the picture and perhaps seek advice and guidance. I wouldn't flaunt the fact that you're talking to them because that'll backfire on you. But uh, I don't see a problem in, in, in having some dialogue there as long as you're still going through all the steps up the ladder in a respectful way. Just to supplement that, often it's a technique that uh, is used of blind copies of documents that you're putting in at a lower level just to send it on to the minister's office. So they, there will be a staffer there that will be aware of this activity that's percolating on at a lower level. And you're not really asking them to do anything with that information other than to file it and say, you may need that information base uh, at some time in the future if this problem isn't resolved or if it somehow explodes. And, uh, and, and it's always helpful. The, the, the thing that ministers hate the most is surprise. And if you can somehow, through the use of staff and information, avoid the surprises, you're halfway there to maintaining a very good relationship. Any other questions? Well, thank you very much, David. Uh, very useful insights, and uh, good luck, but not too much. <laughs> OK. I, uh, I didn't get into the subject of planning questions to ministers in the House, because that's something that I never do. Uh, somebody else might be able to speak on that, but I never Well, do. we have some very qualified people in the audience. Thank you.